The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, welcome back, everybody, to AO3. Um, uh, today, we are going to continue the discussion of a wave equation uh, starting from uh, last uh, lecture. Uh, so what have we learned last time? As a reminder, uh, we have uh, started uh, to uh, study the behavior of a wave equation. We understood uh, uh, basic uh, uh, behavior of uh, the wave equation uh, uh, and also are trying to solve the general uh, a solution of the wave equation. The first thing which we learn, as usual, is the normal modes. What are the normal modes in, in, the, in the case of wave equation or continuous uh, translation symmetric system? What we found last time is that they are standing waves. And uh, of course, as usual, the full solution of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, which is the general uh, uh, description of this system is the superposition of infinite number of normal modes. And uh, that means one can understand this kind of system uh, systematically uh, using a Fourier series. So this is just a reminder. So we, what we have done is that basically we start with infinite number of uh, coupled oscillators and uh, we make the space between uh, those uh, uh, massive objects in the system smaller and smaller and until it becomes continuous, right? And uh, a very interesting thing happened that automatically already give you wave equations, okay? So which is actually shown here. Um, last time, as I mentioned, we discussed the normal modes, which are standing waves. Those are the first few uh, normal modes and also the functional form of the uh, normal modes. Uh, which are standing waves. So the structure just looks like this. So you have AM, which is the amplitude, uh, sine KM X plus alpha M, which can be determined by uh, boundary conditions, and the sine omega MT plus beta M. That means all the points in the system are oscillating at the same frequency, omega M, and at the same phase, which is beta M. And also, uh, Based on the wave equation, if you plug this uh, solution back into the uh, equation, you will find that omega n is actually not a free parameter. It's actually uh, proportional to uh, 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 km, which is the wave number of uh, m's normal mode. And uh, this, uh, this constant uh, vp, we will find that uh, today, this is actually the, 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 the speed of the wave uh, uh, in the case of traveling wave. And if you uh, look at the individual normal modes and uh, uh, make plot of those normal modes as a function of time, you can see from here there are six uh, different normal modes and they are like a sinusoidal shape in terms of amplitude as a function of uh, position uh, on, the, on the string. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, if you distort the string more, then you get a higher oscillation frequency as you uh, see from uh, n equal to one to n equal to six case. So as I mentioned today, we will talk about another interesting kind of solution, which is progressing wave solution, okay? Why, why is this, uh, very, uh, this uh, solution exciting? That is because this actually matches uh, what we actually usually learn about waves, right? So we, and also, uh, this solution actually enables us to send for example, energy from one point to another point. This is what I'm doing now, right? I'm sending energy from my mouth to your ear so that you can hear what I have been talking about, right? About AO3, right? So, um, so that's really cool, and uh, I, we will uh, uh, do, uh, uh, try to understand how actually we can get this uh, solution out of this strange uh, wave equation, okay? So what is shown here is the normal mode, and we are going to talk about a second kind of solution, which is the uh, uh, progressing wave solution. 
And this solution have this form, psi xt will be equal to some kind of function, f. And this is actually a function of x minus vp times t. This is actually a general form of the progressing wave. And f function is some kind of wave well behaved function of your, your choice. OK, so the first thing which I would like to do is to, is to show that this functional form is actually the solution of the wave equation, right? So pretty straightforward. We can actually go ahead and plug that into this uh, equation. And the, before that, I would define tau is uh, to be uh, x minus vp times t, OK? So in order to prepare for plugging in this equation into, uh, uh, plugging in this uh, uh, functional form to a wave equation, uh, I would calculate uh, uh, using chain law, partial f, partial x will be equal to partial f, partial tau, partial tau, partial f, x. And this will give you partial f, partial tau times uh, in this case, partial tau, partial x will give you 1. OK? And that will give you f prime tau. OK? Therefore, we can go ahead and calculate as well partial square f partial x square. OK? That will give you f double prime tau. So this is actually the first set of equation I need and in order to uh, describe the right-hand side of the uh, wave equation. The other uh, equation which I need in the preparation for plugging in the whole thing into the wave equation is to calculate partial f, partial t. And according to Chen Luo, partial f, partial t is equal to partial f, partial tau, partial tau, T. In this case, f is actually a, a function of x minus vpt, and tau is defined as x minus vpt. Therefore, you can actually immediately conclude that this will be equal to minus vp partial f partial tau. And that is actually equal to minus vp f prime. Similarly, you can calculate partial square of f, partial t square, and that will give you a vp square f prime, uh, f double prime, because we, we did a, a double differential. Okay. All right. So from the first equation and second equation, which I have on the board, we can actually plug back that into the, the, the uh, wave equation. And what I'm, I'm going to get is partial square f partial t square. That would be equal to vp square partial square f partial x square. So that is actually exactly the wave equation, which we, we actually uh, 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 get uh, from. Uh, uh, from, uh, we actually show uh, from the beginning. So that means this functional form satisfy the wave equation. And uh, I didn't even specify what is actually f function. f function is some kind of well-behaved function. And uh, it can be of all kinds of different shape, which we will discuss later. But that is actually pretty encouraging. That means if you try to distort this string, and, uh, and if this shape is actually uh, uh, propagating at, uh, OK, have, have the functional form of uh, x, uh, x minus, uh, OK, if you have any function which you have a functional form of f of uh, x minus vpt, no matter what kind of shape that is, this shape is going to be, uh, First of all, this function is a solution to the wave equation. Secondly, we will show you that this shape is going to be propagating uh, at the speed of vp. And the shape will not change. It will stay like that forever, uh, according to uh, the wave equation. OK? Um, 
there's another functional form which can also be uh, 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 the functional form of the progressing wave. We, we, we usually write it as f k x plus or minus omega d. Okay, and in this case, if uh, omega is essentially v p times k, which is essentially uh, uh, already uh, required from the discussion of normal modes, then this equation, uh, this kind of functional form, is also the solution of wave equation. Okay, and of course you can actually uh, go ahead and prove that uh, 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 probably uh, after the, the lecture. Uh, the, the proof will be very similar to what we have done here. So now, let's actually try to understand what does this function mean. So I have a function which is f of x minus vp times t, where x is actually the position of the, uh, the, uh, uh, on the string, and the t is actually the time, which I go ahead and check this uh, function. And uh, for example, if I, I, can, I can give you an example, uh, a function. For example, I can make it like a triangular shape like this. And this is actually plotted as a function of tau. So f of tau is actually giving you the information of the shape of the progressing wave. So that's discussed if I write f of x minus vt, what does that mean? OK, first of all, I can take t equal to 0. What, what will happen is that at that instance of time, t equal to 0, x is equal to tau. That means at t equal to 0, the shape of the string will look like this, like this function. OK? Now, I would like to know how this string is going to evolve as a function of time, right? So that's actually all we care, right? And that means I'm going to increase t to a larger value, OK? So suppose, originally, I have at t equal to 0, I'm sitting at, on this point, OK? I'm sampling f at this position, OK? If I increase t, OK, if I increase t from 0 to a larger value, where I will start to sample? Where I, where I, where I move to the left-hand side or right-hand side? Anybody can help me. Because this function form is actually x minus vt, right? What will happen if I increase t? Tau will increase or decrease? Decrease. Very good. So decrease, right? So that means at the fixed x, I'm going to sample this point. OK? What does that mean? That means originally, if I plot everything in terms of x, OK? Originally, it have this shape. Now, if I increase t, what is going to happen is that originally, I, I was sampling this shape here, and now I am sampled in the shape here, OK? That means at t equal to t prime, which is larger than t, this shape, first of all, is unchanged. Secondly, it's actually moving. The, the shape looks like as if it's moving in the horizontal direction. And the, the direction of this movement is in the positive x direction. If I write my progressing wave so, uh, solution in the functional form of f of x minus uh, vt. OK, it should be vp here. Yeah, sorry for that. OK, any questions? So look at what we have done. So first of all, we have proved that f of x minus vpt, this functional form, is a solution to the wave equation, OK, if it's a solution. 
Secondly, we also discussed the property of this functional form. So that is actually describing a shape, and the, the, the whole shape is going to move as if it's moving as a function of time and uh, to the positive x direction. So let me ask you another question. So what will happen if I write the solution in the form of f of x plus vt? Anybody can help me with the direction of the propagation of the wave? Yeah, go to the left-hand side of the board. That means if I have another expression, I'm using the same f function, which is defined here. In this case, if I write f of x plus vt, that means the, the shape will be moving in the negative uh, x direction. OK, it's symmetric. OK, of course, you can also discuss what will happen if you take this functional form, and uh, uh, you are going to get exactly the same uh, 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 conclusion. So right now, I have been talking about moving, moving uh, uh, shape. So what is actually really moving, right? OK, Professor D, you just told us before that every point on the string can only move up and down. Now you are talking about something is moving in the positive x and negative x direction. What does that mean, right? So let me take, you, uh, take one example. So if I have a Gaussian pulse, OK, and I write this thing in the, term, in, in the form of x uh, minus vt. At time t equal to 0, this shape looks like this. In the next moment, okay, if I increase time to t equal to 1, what is going to happen is that this shape moves uh, toward the positive x direction. Okay? And of course, uh, zeros are the uh, equilibrium uh, position of these waves, uh, of, the, uh, of the string. And uh, what is happening is, is like this. So basically, all the points, all the points on the string are really working together to put, reproduce this uh, uh, shifting, uh, uh, this uh, progressing uh, uh, Gaussian wave. So what is happening is that if I focus on this point, this point will go down, and this point will go down, go down, go down, until I touch this point. So basically, what is happening is like this. All the points are only moving up and down horizontally, but uh, they all move in, in a manner such that if you look at just the shape of the amplitude, the, the amplitude is a function of x, OK? It looks as if the amplitude, the, the shape is actually moving toward positive x direction, moving toward the right hand side of the board. So, what is actually moving? What is moving is actually all the point like mass on the string. They are only moving up and down, but they are moving together so nicely such that it looks as if. The, the whole shape is actually shifting toward the positive x direction. Any questions so far? Okay, okay. so I hope that's straightforward enough. And uh, I would like to discuss with you an interesting situation. Okay, so we have learned that, okay, I can have, uh, for example, triangular pulse, OK? And I can have this triangular pulse moving in the positive uh, x direction. And uh, we will also find out that the speed of the propagation is actually vp, OK? Because that's actually, if you increase t, and that's essentially the speed of you know, movement when you sample the shape on the f of tau, right? So therefore, we can conclude that the speed of this uh, 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 triangular pulse is going to be Vp, OK? 
if I have another triangular pulse starting from the right hand side end of the string, they have exactly the same shape, exactly the same amplitude, okay? So of course, according to what we actually uh, wrote there, they are going to move uh, uh, forever, and uh, at some point, they will actually uh, meet each other. And uh, what is going to happen is that you will have some pulse which is actually two times of the shape at some point, right? Because of the linearity of the, the uh, wave equation, okay? So that's actually pretty straightforward. However, if I consider another case, which is like this. So I have two progressing waves. One is actually going in the right-hand side direction. The other one is going in the left-hand side direction. They have exactly the same shape, but they have the amplitude is actually uh, okay, taking the minus sign, okay? So they, they actually uh, are exactly, uh, they have exactly the same amplitude, but pointing to a different direction. One is actually pointing upward, uh, the other one is actually pointing downward. So at some point, these two waves is going to overlap each other, okay? When they overlap each other, what is going to happen? It's like this. They are going to overlap each other, okay? That means the amplitude will be uh, uh, canceling each other. Then from the experiment, you will see something like this, okay? So now this is the question I would like to ask you. What will happen next? The first possibility is that they cancel. Okay, completely, they disappear. Okay, the second possibility is that, okay, they pass each other. The third possibility is that, okay, it depends on the mood of the stream. Maybe something interesting is popping out. Maybe it's decided to produce, you know, two uh, circular waves. Get creative, right? Creative. Okay, so how many, okay, everybody have to vote, okay? How many of you think that it will cancel and disappear. Anybody? Nobody? Really? Okay, so you can see that here, nothing is there, right? Why don't you think that will be canceled? Okay, nobody thinks that will cancel. Very good. Maybe we are all wrong, right? <laughs> Second, they'll pass each other. How many of you think so? Very good. Finally, how many of you think that will be, you know, it depends on the mood of the string. Get creative. One, two, three. Thank you for the support. <laughs> there are four people. Okay. Okay. So let's discuss this situation uh, uh, carefully. So the first situation, if they cancel exactly, okay? Which sounds logical, right? Because you, if you look at this string, okay? How could this string remember what happened before, right? How could it remember, right? Therefore, shouldn't answer number one be a logical choice, right? The catch is, okay, if they cancel, then that means energy is not conserved, right? So somehow the energy I put in, you know, I worked really hard to shake this string, right? Use my energy. 
and uh, it disappeared. Oh my God, disappeared. <laughs> right? Then Yanji is sad, okay? The second one is, okay, I believe in energy conservation. So they will pass each other, but that means the string have memory, right? Because right now, there's nothing there. What is going on? Can somebody, okay, since most of you think that is actually what is happening, can some of you explain me what, how this string actually remember what happened before? Anybody can help me? Maybe the two waveforms like reflect off of each other, um, kind of balance off of each other, so yeah. Yeah, they balance each other, but uh, how, how is this different from a stationary? Uh, yeah. a, a string at rest. Of course, I mean, at some point it, it looks identical, right? But there's something which is different between this one and that one. Hmm? Very good point. This one, which is actually unperturbed, have zero velocity, right? And this one, no, it actually have a gut velocity. Actually, this thing is already starting to, uh, is already ready to move down. And this part of the string is already ready to move up. Okay, so that is actually how the string can remember what happened before. It remember it by the velocity. Okay, so what is actually not probably here is a trick, right? Is actually the velocity. The velocity is already non-zero compared to this uh, situation. And uh, what is going to happen is that afterward, you will produce uh, two corresponding triangular piles, continue and pass each other. Okay, finally, the third condition, creative that may not happen because all the memory is still there in the form of uh, 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 kin kinetic energy. Okay, so we can actually go ahead and uh, uh, do a small demonstration here. Okay, so, so let's focus on the right-hand side part of this uh, setup. So this is actually the Bell Lab machine uh, we had uh, before, okay? So now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to create a square pulse, positive square pulse from the left hand side, and the negative square, uh, uh, negative uh, pulse in the right hand side, and hope well, and see what is going to happen. Okay? No, not like this. Stop. Stop. Okay. All right. Let's do it. You see, they pass each other, and uh, the shape actually continues. So let's do that again. They cancel at some point, but they do pass each other and continue. And there are some refraction, et cetera, which I, we are going to discuss afterward. Let's do that again. You see, right? At some point, they cancel, but the, the positive pulse continue, traveling to your left hand side, and the, the negative pulse travel to your right hand side. Okay, continue, please. Okay, so based on the experiment, most of you actually were correct. The answer is number two. And uh, I would like to show you a few more examples uh, based on uh, my little simulation. So first of all, I would like to show you a square, uh, so a triangular pulse, they pass each other. And you can see that uh, they, they pass each other and the shape is actually changing as a function of time and uh, actually afterward, they continue and, uh, uh, and they keep the same shape based on this com com uh, computer simulation. Another interesting thing to notice is that if you focus on the point at x equal to zero, you see that this point actually never change amplitude, right? Because this, those two powers are really symmetric. One is positive, the other one is negative. Right? Okay, as usual, 
we can actually change the shape of the piles. For example, I change it to circular shape and see what will happen. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, again, the, the, the position at x equal to zero is unchanged. Let's, let's take a look at that again. It really does sound seem really funny. It looks like vroom. <laughs> and uh, you can see that it is actually the velocity of the, the power, uh, of the string, uh, of the individual component of the string, which is remember the, in the original shape, right? So you can see the velocity, uh, okay, by I looks different from what you see before in the first example. And finally, as usual, we have the NIT waves. <laughs> it does really, really crazy things. And the amazing thing is that the string has such a good memory, right? It re really remember what is going to happen before they touch each other, okay? Okay. So, so what is going to happen to these two NIT waves? They are going to be propagating forever, cannot stop until the edge of the universe. Maybe they dig out of the universe, but not my problem anymore. Um, okay, so we talk about the energy stored in the string and the et cetera. So how about we go ahead and calculate the kinetic energy and the potential energy? So the first part, is the kinetic energy. Okay, from A01 is actually half mv square, right? So if I consider a small segment uh, on the string, which have a width of delta x, okay? And I can now calculate a delta m. If I assume this, string have a uh, mass per unit length rho L and the string tension T, okay? If that's actually given to you when we set up the experiment, then we can actually calculate the, the mass of this uh, small uh, uh, portion of the string. Then delta M, the mass will be equal to rho L times dx because rho L is the mass per unit length, right? Therefore, what is actually the kinetic energy is becoming pretty straightforward. It's the integration over the whole string, okay? Integration over the whole string is one half, based on this uh, equation, rho L dx, okay? And times V. What, so, but what is actually V here? V is actually the velocity of individual uh, point like mass on the string, right? So, and we actually already talked about that the velocity of individual mass is actually only in the y direction, right? And the, the position of individual mass is described by, uh, by the uh, uh, function psi, okay? Therefore, what is actually velocity? Velocity is actually partial psi, partial t. Right? So that is actually giving you the velocity of individual uh, mass on the string. And if you square that, uh, that is actually giving you the total kinetic energy is in this functional form. Okay? Let's also discuss what is actually the potential energy. The potential energy, okay? As you remember, delta W, the work, is equal to F times delta S, the displacement. F is the force, and the delta S is the displacement. So originally, before we, we actually uh, perturb and uh, dis uh, make some displacement with respect to equilibrium position, uh, this string have originally if I look at the small part of the string, okay, I zoom in this region, okay, this looks like this. This is delta x, and uh, it has a constant string tension t, okay? Now, I can actually uh, 
uh, introduce uh, some displacement. And what is going to happen is look, it's going to look, look like this. OK, this string is actually a little bit stretched, right? And uh, this is actually the original delta x, the width of this uh, little segment, right? And uh, this direction is actually a small uh, change in the uh, uh, y direction, OK? Which is actually uh, uh, showing us delta psi. And of course, we can calculate the length, right? The length of this string. And, uh, and that will give you square root of delta x squared plus delta psi squared. OK. We can now go ahead and calculate uh, uh, the delta w, right? So delta w will be equal to um, f, which is the force, times delta s. OK, we know the force, the magnitude of the force is what? Is the string tension, right? OK, so therefore I put t here. And delta s, what is delta s? It's how much I stretch this string, right? So this is actually the difference between the resulting length and the, the original length, delta x. OK? So that is actually giving you the delta s. OK? So that means I can write it in this functional form, dx squared plus d psi squared minus dx. OK? And this can, I can, of course, take delta x out of this uh, square root of uh, uh, square root thing. And basically, I get delta x square root of 1 plus d psi dx squared minus dx. Remember what we have been discussing uh, until now. We were always discussing small amplitude or small vibration, right? Therefore, that means I can use a, a small uh, uh, angle approximation. That means delta psi is going to be very, very small, OK, with respect to delta x, OK? So that means the first turn will be roughly delta x 1 plus d psi dx squared 1 over 2, right? Because you have a square root of that plus higher order term. OK? And of course, we assume that delta psi is actually much smaller than delta x. Therefore, I, we ignore all those higher order terms, OK? So if we actually replace this expression back into the original equation, you will see that the first term, 1, cancel with this minus dx term, right? This should cancel that, OK? It should cancel. Therefore, I can calculate dw will be equal to t times delta x times 1 over 2 d psi dx squared. OK? Therefore, what will be the total potential energy? The total potential energy will be an integration of uh, this, uh, the, uh, the work dw over the whole uh, uh, range from, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the system. And uh, basically, you can actually write it down as 1 over 2 t uh, psi. I just psi. I just x squared dx. OK? All right. So we can actually understand uh, and the calculate the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So before we take a break, 
let's take a short example to check if we understand what we have learned so far. So for example, I have a, if I have a function psi xt, okay, and now this is actually uh, equal to one over one plus x minus three t to the fourth. It's a crazy function, okay? If I assume that I, I can do a very precise uh, thing, manipulate this string so that I produce a wave function of this functional form, one over one plus x minus three t to the fourth. Can somebody tell me what is actually going to be the velocity of the wave? Can anybody tell me? The first thing which you can do is to express this crazy function in the functional form of f x minus v p t, right? And the VP is actually the speed of the, the wave, right? So, so anybody know what this is? Yes. Yeah, that's three, right? Because the whole function can be written as f x minus three t, right? Therefore, the velocity VP will be three. Of course, if you are not sure, you can actually calculate VP square by the ratio of partial square psi partial t square, and uh, partial square psi partial x square. And that will give you, of course, the vp square according to that wave equation, OK? All right, so we will take a five minute break from now. And uh, during the break, I will uh, try to uh, return the exam to you, OK? So we will uh, come back at uh, 24, 1224. Okay, so welcome back, everybody. So we will continue the discussion of uh, traveling wave. Uh, so we have a very interesting discussion of uh, two waves that are canceling each other, and uh, somehow the string have a way to remember what happened before, which is actually the velocity of each individual point on the string as a function of x, okay, that, uh, at that instance of time. So that's they should take a look at this example. So make use of what we have learned so far. Okay, we as we see here, there is a triangular shape, which I create in the lab. And uh, this triangular shape is actually uh, there and uh, it's stationary. It's not moving. Okay, the the the, the strings are at rest. Okay, but have a a, a triangular shape, which I set up there, okay? So based on what we have learned so far, we have learned normal modes, we have learned about uh, traveling wave, right? I believe before we learn this class, the first reaction to you is to do what? What kind of decomposition? Fourier decomposition, right? So what you are going to do is, Okay, very good. I have this shape. So I do a Fourier decomposition, and I have infinite number of turns, and I am going to evolve infinite number of turns as a function of time and see what will happen to the system, right? So that's actually what you would do before we learn traveling wave, okay? What I would like to say today is that if I really prefer this thing at rest, stationary, okay, at t equal to zero, in contrast to what I just said before, a uh, brute force method, which I use computer to decompose it and evolve all the infinite number of turns, what we could do is that I can show you that this situation is a superposition of two traveling waves. Then the, the, then the question becomes super simple, okay? So instead of doing a brute force uh, 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 calculation using computer, decompose it to infinite number of normal modes, 
what I can actually show you is that, okay, if I have a G function, okay, if I have a G function, which is equal to F x plus V P T plus F x minus V P T, okay? So this G function is a superposition of two traveling waves, okay? The shape is described by F function, and one of them is traveling to the right-hand side, the other one is actually traveling to the left-hand side, okay? If I assume that this, the superposition of these two traveling waves is G, okay? Then I can now calculate the velocity, partial G, partial T, and that will give you Vp f prime minus, right, because here it's actually x minus Vp, right? So I got minus Vp out of it, f prime. Okay, the first then, if I do this partial differentiation, then basically I get a v positive Vp out of it, and then the second term I get minus Vp out of it. Okay, and these two terms cancel exactly. Okay, what does that mean? That means all the points, okay, this g is actually a function of x and t. All the point at t equal to zero, okay, will have initially velocity equal to zero. Okay? So in other words, if I have any random kind of shape, okay, in this case, it's a triangular shape, okay? I can always decompose this stationary shape into two traveling waves, okay? One is actually traveling in the positive direction. The other one is traveling in the negative direction, okay? So that means what is happening? This is equal to a superposition of two traveling waves. If I assume the height of this mountain to be h, okay, then I need to have h over two as the height for the individual traveling waves. One is actually traveling to the right hand side. The other one is actually traveling to the left hand side of the board, okay? So based on this trick, Actually, we can see that, huh, I don't need to do infinite number of turns anymore, right? I don't need to do a Fourier decomposition and get really crazy and uh, take forever to, to write the, 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 the code on your computer. And maybe there's some bug in your code, um, which is frustrating. <laughs> and uh, what we could do is to simply decompose it into two traveling waves and I can now predict what will happen at time equal to, uh, for example, five, what is going to happen. So what is going to happen is that you will have two triangular shape waves. Each of them actually traveled uh, by a distance of five times Vp. Okay. So that is actually a very interesting fact. And of course we can see from here, if I quickly create a triangular shape, and you will see that it really did become two triangular uh, shape uh, waves. So I can do this, right? Okay, I can do this. You see? So originally, I'm creating some stationary shape Okay, and I release that. It does become two traveling waves with amplitude half of the original height, original displacement. I can also do it in the opposite direction, right? A positive wave. You see? It, it does work. And of course, after the class, you can make even more complicated shape if I have many more than two hands. Maybe I can do that, but unfortunately I'm human. Um, 
Okay, you can see that I can create different slope in the positive and negative edge, and uh, it does create two uh, traveling wave. And uh, that's amazing because this is actually looks like just some kind of mathematical trick, and re it really match with what we can do experimentally. Okay. So finally, I would like to uh, talk about the last topic of, of the lecture today. which is to connect uh, two strings uh, together, okay? So suppose I have two strings. The left-hand side string is actually Signer. It has a uh, um, mass per unit length rho L and string tension T. In the right-hand side, you can have a Seeker string with uh, uh, mass per unit length four times rho L, and the string tension is as you keep constant T. Okay? Based on what we have learned before, the velocity, the velocity VP, okay, is equal to square root of uh, T over rho L, right? So that's actually uh, from the last few lectures. So to the left hand side, you will have V1 which is the velocity of the traveling wave equal to square root of t over rho l. And the right-hand side, you will have square root of t over 4l, 4 rho l, sorry. And that will give you one half of v1, okay? So what does that mean? This means that if I have a traveling wave in the left-hand side, the speed of the traveling wave will be two times the speed of the traveling wave in the right-hand side based on this calculation, okay? So what I would like to do is the following. So I would like to ask a question about this system. What will happen if I introduce a displacement and a traveling wave from the left-hand side? And the question is, what is going to happen to this system as a function of time once I actually give this input traveling wave? And uh, the answer is that this traveling wave is going to pass through the boundary of two systems, and uh, there may be refraction, there may be transmission, etc. and uh, we are actually in the good position to understand this phenomenon, okay? So that's take a look at this situation carefully. So now I define here the position of the, the boundary is, equal to, is at x equal to zero, okay? And uh, I can now go ahead and uh, write down the conditions which is, uh, need to be satisfied in order to connect these two systems properly, which you, you actually already see, uh, see this uh, several times, the boundary condition. So what are the boundary conditions which I need in order to connect the left-hand side and right-hand side systems? Okay, so the first boundary condition is that the string is continuous, right? Therefore, if I have some kind of uh, uh, y is actually y of uh, x t is describing the displacement of all the little mass on the string in the in the horizontal direction. Then that means y the left hand side evaluated at zero minus in the in the slightly left hand side of the uh, the boundary will be equal to y uh, r, which is actually uh, evaluated at the side, the uh, right-hand side of the boundary at x equal to zero, okay? And the yl is actually the wave function for the left-hand side sinus string, and the yr is actually uh, the wave function which describes the right-hand side of the string, okay? So this means that the, the uh, uh, the boundary condition tells us that the, uh, 
um, the, um, the, the string cannot break, right? It's, it, it should match uh, carefully so that these two systems are connected to each other properly. The second condition is that, okay, since this boundary actually have uh, no massive particles there, right? So, so no, uh, no uh, I can actually assume that this uh, mass is uh, ring there, okay? Therefore, the slope of the left hand side, partial YL, partial X, S equal to zero, okay? Will have to be equal to the slope at the right hand side. Okay, if the slope doesn't match between the left hand side and right hand side, that means since they have constant tension, right? That means the tension, the string tension cannot cancel each other. Then the mass of the string will be transferred to, for example, Mars in a second, right? Because it has huge infinite amount of acceleration. And that didn't happen, right? When I actually try to actually uh, uh, displace the, uh, uh, the, the string or the, the bell, uh, uh, lab, uh, bell lab system, I didn't see crazy things happen, right? Therefore, the tension at this, which acting on this massive ring must cancel each other. So that's the second boundary condition we, we have. Okay? So now, I would like to make some assumption. So first of all, I have an inf uh, input pulse which is actually uh, uh, com coming into uh, this system. Looks like this. And I call it Fi. It's traveling uh, to the positive uh, x direction, right? So therefore, I can, uh, of course, write it down as uh, minus k1x plus omega t, OK? And uh, I can. So this is actually the in, uh, incident pulse. I call it Fi. And uh, after it passed the boundary, okay, so I can actually uh, expect that there may be some kind of refraction which happened at the boundary, Fr. I call it Fr. And this time, this uh, Fr is going to be uh, traveling to the negative x direction. Therefore, I can exp express this function as fr is a function of plus k1x plus omega t. Okay. Finally, there can be also transmission wave, right? So you, you get the refraction, and there can be some energy which somehow pass through the boundary, and uh, I call this transmission wave ft which is actually uh, in the form of minus k2x plus omega t. OK? And in this case, I assume that uh, the, the, the system is actually uh, uh, having a k1 in the left-hand side and k2 in the right-hand side, which is actually the wave number. And the k1 is actually equal to omega over v1 and the k2 is actually equal to omega over v2, OK? So that is actually the setup, and also the three uh, uh, traveling waves, which we actually uh, uh, demonstrate this uh, situation. So we can now go ahead and plug those three uh, traveling wave uh, solution into the boundary conditions, and we will be able to solve their relative amplitudes. So let's make use of the first boundary condition. OK? So the YL, so YL is now a superposition of Fi and uh, Fr. YR will be just a transmission wave, Ft. OK? So now I can plug, that, plug this expression back into the equation number one. Then basically what I get is F i omega t, okay? Because this is actually, originally it's actually minus k1x plus omega t, right? But this thing is actually evaluated 
at x equal to 0. OK? The wave function has to be continuous between the negative side of at 0 and the positive side of 0. Therefore, if I plug in x equal to 0, minus k1 turn disappear, and what is that over is omega t. OK? And this is the second term, fr, I can write down explicitly, you get fr omega t. And the right-hand side of the expression is yr, only have one term, ft, and now you are going to get ft omega t. OK? So now we can also go ahead and plug in this equation uh, to equation number two. Right. So what is going to uh, what what is going to happen is that I do a partial differential uh, differentiation with respect to x and uh, and uh, plugging x equal to zero to the expression, and what I'm going to get is minus k one f prime i. It's a function of omega t plus k one f r prime omega t. And this will be equal to minus k2. In the right-hand side, you only have one term, which is ft, right? So you are going to have f minus f k2, ft, the function of omega t. OK? Any questions so far? Yes. Ah, yes. Thank you very much. OK, very good. So we are making progress here. And what I can do now is to do an integration uh, over t for, for the equation number two, right? So if I do an integration, basically what I'm going to get is minus k1 over 2 fi omega t. OK, I do an integration over t plus, OK, OK, over omega, sorry. OK, and the plus k1 over omega fr, omega t. And this is actually equal to minus k2 over omega ft, omega t. OK? Based on the equation which we had before, k1 over omega is actually 1 over v1, right? So basically, what we have is actually, this is actually 1 over v1, this is actually 1 over v1, and this is actually 1 over v2, OK? So in short, what we are going to get in the, sec the second equation, OK, will become minus v2 fi omega t plus, plus fr omega t, OK? If I multiply both sides by v1 and v2, right, then I get the v minus v2 here, right? And this will be equal to, OK, this should be, there should be a minus sign here, right? Because I'm taking out uh, minus v2 there, OK? And uh, this will be equal to the right-hand side, the right-hand side, because I multiply both sides by v1 and v2, right? Basically, I get v minus v1 ft omega t. OK, so what is actually left over is that now I have equation number one and I have equation number two. Those are just functions of fi, fr, and ft, right? So that means we can actually easily solve the, the equation and write everything in terms of fi. So we can now solve 1 and 2 and write in terms of fi, right? Which is actually the incident uh, wave, right? So what, what, that's actually what we could do. So if I do that, I, if I solve the equation 1 and 2, basically I get fr omega t will be equal to v2 minus v1 divided by v2 plus v1 uh, times fi omega t. 
if you trust me, if I try, I, I try to solve one and two and uh, express fr and ft in terms of fi, then basically the second thing which I get from this solution is that ft will be equal to 2 v2 divided by v1 plus v2. fi omega p. OK? So look at what we have done, OK? Basically, the first thing which we did is to identify what are the boundary conditions. Boundary condition one is the string doesn't break at the boundary. The slope match between the two boundaries because you have constant tension, OK? Then I assume the solution have the functional form of three traveling wave, the incident traveling wave, fi, traveling to the positive direction. Refraction is expressed as a, you know, fr going to the negative direction. And finally, ft is, going, is the transmission wave going to the positive direction, OK? Then I plug those equations into the, uh, the boundary condition, and I solve everything, fr and ft, in terms of fi. And this is actually what I get, OK? So that's actually in short what I have been, uh, have been doing, OK? So basically, this expression is actually equal to r times fi, where r is actually v2 minus v1 divided by v1 plus v2. And in this case, this is equal to uh, 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 transmission, which I write it as tau times F, uh, ft, right? Oh, sorry, fi, the initial uh, incident wave. And this tau is equal to 2 times v2 divided by v1 plus v2. OK, so in this example, v2 is equal to 1 over 2 v1, right? So I can now plug it in and see what I get. Basically, uh, v2 will be equal to v1 over 2. Then I can evaluate what will be the r and the t, right? Uh, and tau, right? So the r will be minus 1 third. It's a negative value. And the tau will be equal to 2 over 3. OK? So what have we learned from here? So if I create a pulse starting from the, the one which is actually have, which is lighter uh, or sm have smaller uh, row L, smaller mass per uh, unit length, when it passes through the boundary, OK, there will be a refracted wave, which the amplitude will change its sign. So what is going to happen is that you will get a refracted wave, and the amplitude change its sign, and there will be a transmitted wave, which is actually going to the positive direction. Okay. So this is actually a demonstration we have here. So left hand side is the system which I was talking about. Okay, the smaller L, row L system, and right hand side is the larger row L system. Okay, and now I can do the experiment and see what happened. And I connect, oh, no, I connect the two system with with this ring. Okay, so that they are coupled to each other. OK, I hope it will work. All right. So now I can create, oh, oh I'm in trouble now. One second. I hope I will, hope they will. This is not easy. OK, now I can create a, a pulse from the left hand side. Oh, no.
that is the pressure, okay? So now I can create a pulse from the left hand side, and you can see that there's a small pulse actually uh, pass through the, the median, but uh, uh, pass through the, the boundary, but uh, unfortunately this, the more is not set up already. Okay, so we'll see what we can get from here. Ah, now it works. Very good. Okay, so now I can actually put, create a, a pulse from the left hand side. And you can see that it does pass through this boundary. If I set up the ring, the ring was falling down somehow during the, during the lecture. And this ring is actually presenting the boundary and connect these two systems, right? Based on what we predict from the equation, basically you will see that if I have a positive uh, amplitude passing through the boundary, okay, there will be a neg negative uh, uh, pulse going backward and uh, a positive pulse going uh, through the, the boundary, okay, which is the transmitted wave. And let's see what is going to happen. You see, it does have a negative uh, uh, pulse going backward and you do see that there's a pulse which is actually going through this system. Let's see this again. You see that there's a positive amplitude pulse going through the boundary, and there's a refraction through uh, this, uh, uh, which is actually going backward in a left-hand side system, okay? So on the other hand, if my I start a traveling wave from the right-hand side, uh, okay, your, your left hand side, okay? That means V2 is going to be larger than V1, right? Uh, V2 is actually going to be uh, larger than the V1, right? So what you're go going to get is a positive uh, amplitude uh, refraction and uh, also positive uh, uh, value uh, transmission wave. And let's see what is going to happen. You see, the refraction is positive this time, and the transmission wave have also positive amplitude. Let's take a look at this thing again. A very nice pulse, and you can see the, the refraction. Because of this mathematics, interesting thing is that it match with the experimental result, and the, the prediction was that you are going to get the positive amplitude refractive wave, and it, it does. Uh, agree with the experimental data. Okay, so this is actually what we have learned. So we have learned traveling wave solution, energy of an oscillating string, and also the potential kinetic energy. And also, we learned how to actually match two media and uh, passing, how, how this uh, traveling wave pass through the median, etc. And next time, we will talk about more systems uh, described by wave equations and also dispersion relation. What, what does that mean, etc. Thank you very much, and see you on Thursday.